So again, my name is Anique Baudet, and I'm the Assistant Director for Transportation Planning at the Austin Transportation Department. And this week is an exciting week for mobility in Austin. Yesterday, Michael Bloomberg was here announcing that we are the recipients of a grant to forward our, sustain, our ambitious sustainability goals in the city, not only to address climate change, but also to address forwarding sustainable transportation. In that regard, today, is also uh, a great day because it marks the end of the week of a two-year process of our last phase of community engagement for the update or complete overhaul, really, of our locally focused transportation plan. And in that plan, we are forwarding choices, and that's important, mobility choices that address the mobility and affordability challenges that are facing the city. Key components to affordability are not only mobility, but our household costs together, looking at them together. And this transportation plan took uh, a new approach to hearing new voices in the planning process, those of underrepresented communities, those that have been historically underrepresented in planning processes, because by understanding the needs of people of color, youth, seniors, and people with disabilities, and addressing those needs in our planning processes and the plans that we bring forward, to our policymakers to adopt, we raise the whole community. If we can raise access to opportunity for those who need it the most. Also addressing safety, our mobility plan, the first chapter in our mobility plan is about safety, forwarding our vision zero goals. So it's an exciting week. We're tying up that last phase of public engagement in a two year process. Um, those on the Austin Strategic Mobility Plan team, if you're here, if you could raise your hand, I wanna say thank you. Um, for the hard work in doing things different with public engagement and really having rich input um, into this plan that we bring to City Council. I also want to welcome our City Council members um, that are here today and Kitchen. Thank you for being here. And we have Mayor's aide, John Michael Cortez here. Thank you for being here as well as we take uh, this two-year planning process um, to the next level. Now, are we experts at the Austin Transportation Department on doing equitable planning processes? Well, maybe. We've really done things differently. But I'm excited for having Dr. Lugo here today so that I can sit in the audience along with my staff and be a student today and learn more about the topic of mobility justice. And I thank the Imagine Austin Speaker Series for teeing up the opportunity uh, to bring speakers in like Dr. Lugo. I'm going to read her bio, um, and then we can get right into the meat of, uh, of her topic, which is mobility justice. Uh, Dr. Lugo um, is affiliate faculty in urban sustainability at Anatoc University in Los Angeles. She's an urban anthropologist, bicyclist, advocate, and college professor. She spent the last decade researching, re researching racial inclusion in active transportation. Her book, Bicycle Race, Bicycle Race, Transportation Culture and Resistance was pu published in 2018. Dr. Lugo serves as a, an advisory board co-chair for Los Angeles-based community-based organization People for Mobility Justice and is a core organizer of the, unto of the Untokening, a national collective. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Lugo to Austin. Thank you. All right, I'm going to get my props situated up here. Uh, I am thrilled to be here this morning, and let's have a good conversation and then get out there where it is such a beautiful day. Uh, really nice to have such a lovely morning after our rainstorm last night. Um, here is a new practice that I'm working on incorporating into my speaking. Uh, which is to honor the indigenous history of the land um, that we're meeting on. And there is this cool app called Native Lands that will tell you anywhere in the country whose uh, historical territory you are in um, using GPS, which is pretty cool. Uh, so what I learned from that app, not from my own uh, engagement or relationship building, is that we are on the historical territory of the, uh, I think, Tonkwara and Comanche people. Does anybody want to confirm or correct me on that? Yeah? So um, I'm just thrilled to be here from California um, in this space. 
So what I'm going to do today is talk about this concept of mobility justice through a few different lenses, um, primarily through talking about my own uh, journey as an anthropologist and activist in uh, bicycle spaces. But I also want to start us with a grounding in the academic concept of mobility justice, um, which is something being really well defined by an interdisciplinary group of scholars. And then hopefully at the end, we can get into, uh, in the Q&A section, me learning from you all what mobility justice has been looking like in Austin, or what are some of the areas where it seems like there could be some connections built um, as a sort of starting point. So, I need to turn this clicker on, and that is here. Now it is buzzing at me, and let's see what happens. Where am I pointing the clicker? Down here? I think it's on. Oh, it's the wrong button. Oh, right, okay, the arrow was scratched off. So, the theory of what is mobility justice. Uh, one of my academic uh, heroes is a sociologist named Mimi Scheller, who is based at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And she put out a book just last year called Mobility Justice, The Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes. And what she lays out at the beginning of that book is how uh, the issue of mobility justice is what comes up when we look at an ideal of freedom of mobility. So she says freedom of mobility may be considered a universal human right, yet in practice it exists in relation to class, race, sexuality, gender, and ability exclusions from public space, from national citizenship, from access to resources, and from the means of mobility at all scales. So those of us who have uh, worked on increasing access to sustainable transportation, um, increasing street safety, things like that, have tended to approach those projects um, from a particular perspective that is more common um, in urban planning. So looking at the built environment, looking at the design of transportation systems, and what the mobility justice concept urges is that we look at how when people are in motion, the barriers that they experience, the vulnerabilities that they carry are really quite diverse, you know, based on who we are, what our experiences have been, the identities we have, and what kind of structural inequality exists in the societies um, we live in and the spaces we move through. So from an academic standpoint, mobility justice is kind of like, wow, there's a lot going on when we move through space. There's a lot to be considered and whose needs and safety are being put um, at the fore. So what I've been able to be part of for the last few years is the development of a mobility justice conversation, um, not in the academy, but more in the space of practice in uh, urban planning and advocacy groups that are working on active transportation and sustainable transportation and really just looking at um, what mobility has been or immobility has been in black indigenous um, and people of color communities. So um, at the end of the talk, I'll be talking more about the two projects I'm currently involved in um, that focus on mobility justice. One is the untokening and one is people for mobility justice. But as I said, I want to kind of narrate how I personally got to this mobility justice concept through uh, the field work that I was doing around bicycling um, in Los Angeles for my anthropology PhD. So I got started in 2008 with having noticed that in Southern California, which is this you know, beautiful, sunny place, great weather, um, really not too many hills in the central urban zones, riding a bicycle was considered not really the smartest thing to do, certainly not the most um, a uh, status-oriented thing to do, not something you were gonna do if you had any other options, basically, at all. And um, that stood out to me because I'm from Southern California, born and raised in uh, the suburban zone known as Orange County, but I went to college up in Portland, Oregon. And so, in Portland, 
I became a bike commuter because that's what hipsters did in 2005. They became bike commuters. Wasn't something I put too much thought into, wasn't coming at it from a um, you know very intentional, eco-oriented perspective. It was just a way to get around the city on a, on a cool you know, vintage uh, bike. So when I came back to Southern California for grad school, uh, I was pretty blown away by how hostile the streets felt to riding a bicycle there. I was like, what is going on? Because in Portland, you know, there's the whole drizzle rain thing. You know, it's known for having uh, cloud cover for a good part of the year. LA doesn't have those issues, and yet the culture of streets in LA was way less welcoming to uh, being on a bicycle. And the other thing that really loomed large for me coming back from Portland to um, a much more multiracial zone in Southern California was that there seemed to be some kind of connection between race and class and how we were getting around. And um, over the course of my first year of grad school, it just, it just kind of came together into this research question of, you know, what, what, what is it that makes being on a bicycle or being on foot or using public transit into something that I'm seeing more people of color doing, more struggling people, more immigrants? What, what is that in this region? And, and so then why do we also tend to treat those people who aren't traveling in cars like they don't deserve to be safe or they don't deserve to live? And now that there was a growing group of people who were um, riding bikes by choice, because by 2008 I had become one of those like eco-intentional, like my bicycle is my anti-climate uh, know, change machine. Now that there was a growing group of, of those folks, how were we operating in relation to those other people who had just been using bikes because it was the cheapest way to get around? So I got really interested in this idea of creating what I called bike justice. And the concept of bike justice was really about, okay, let's look at who's riding bicycles, if they're people who also are facing discrimination or uh, certain kinds of barriers because of their race and class status, what is it that we need to do to make their rides safer or improve their rides? Or what can we contribute to planning for bicycling coming from their perspective? So that was, that was the, the Bike Justice Project. And I was really inspired by um, uh, the history of both organizing and um, efforts to uh, kind of revalue the state of transit ridership. So um, there is another researcher who I really admire, who I think now, at least at one point, she was the transportation commissioner for the state of Massachusetts. But she was also a faculty member at Northeastern University, Stephanie Pollock. And she was the lead author on a study that came out in 2010 called Maintaining Diversity in America's Transit-Rich Neighborhoods. And in that study, um, they came up with this, uh, what I found to be a very useful concept of talking about core riders. Um, so in the lingo of public transit, oftentimes um, transit agencies will talk about uh, transit dependent populations um, or, uh, you know, the people who just have to use transit. They're, they're basically like captives. Um, so in this study, the author said, you know, that's really not the most humanizing language. Let's talk about our existing people who are on transit as our core riders, as the ones who, you know, are really the heart of the system. They know the most about it. They're making it work. So I was really inspired by that kind of thinking and wanted to apply it to bicycling. So who were bicycling's core riders? Who were the people who were making bicycling work, even in landscapes that really weren't designed uh, for it to be comfortable or chic or you know a, a cool thing to do. So I got involved in a few different projects in LA that had that uh, idea at their core. And um, the one that was most about this bike justice concept was something we called City of Lights or Ciudad de Luces, where um, we, as a campaign of the local bicycle coalition in Los Angeles, were doing outreach with day laborers who used bikes. So doing outreach in Spanish um, at worker centers, trying to figure out like how could we be a resource for that community and what was the information that they had about riding bikes that wasn't necessarily getting into the planning process. So I wanna show a quick video. Um, this will be the one on YouTube called 
something like City of Lights. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so if we can play this, this tells you about the City of Lights project that we started in 2008 in LA. So this is what I sounded like in 2009. Okay, we can go back to the presentation now. Um, I rediscovered that video uh, in 2018. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> um, the, well, I'll get more to context about the video later, but I think that's a good illustration of what we were working on with the City of Lights campaign. And um, again, you know, it just seemed kind of like there were these Spanish-speaking Latinx bicycle users, there were bicycle advocates. It made sense to try and uh, build some bridges across those uh, groups, especially for um, those of us who, you know, like me, were people of color identifying strongly with promoting bicycling, stuff like that. And so as I was doing my um, graduate field work, I was also doing a lot of research about the history of transportation systems in Southern California. And I learned um, some stuff that was both specific to that region, but then also uh, aspects that were pretty common throughout um, the United States. So um, in the early 20th century, a lot of cities in the US had extensive streetcar systems. And this is a photo that I pulled from a resource online of the streetcar system in Austin. I think this is going up um, Congress here. So uh, a lot of cities around the country had these streetcar systems, and usually they were privately owned systems that were in place to get uh, potential homeowners or home buyers out to neighborhoods that hadn't previously been accessible. Because at that point in time, you know, either you had a, a horse and cart, or if you were a fancy privileged person, you might have a bicycle, or you had your feet. Uh, but these kind of early mass transit systems were really revolutionary in terms of creating, uh, you know, what today we would call urban sprawl or allowing people to get out to these home sites that um, got away from, from urban centers. So uh, Los Angeles had the most extensive streetcar system um, in the country and some people think even in the world in the early 20th century. So, you know, we had lines that were connecting people out to uh, even different counties, San Bernardino County, Orange County, you could get to so many places through these various networks of streetcars. And what happened in the 1920s was as private vehicles started to become affordable, a lot of people decided that that was actually the way they wanted to get around, that they didn't like streetcars. Again, since they were privately owned systems, people didn't necessarily see the streetcars as a public good. 
Uh, and so really public opinion turned against that kind of mass transit in LA in the 20s. And so I was learning this history at the same time that I was working on City of Lights and another project I was part of um, called Cicla Via that was an open street event. And I was trying to kind of see, you know, what were the connections between this race and class thing that I was really noticing in the sustainable transportation space and this longer history. And I found that in LA, a lot of times people would talk about the streetcars as, um, you know, this, this great thing we used to have and we'd made a huge mistake by uh, doing away with those systems. And so there's a lot of nostalgia around the streetcars. Um, the Disney movie, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, is taken as a source of fact for a lot of people about what happened to streetcar systems, that like the big bad you know, corporate guys came in and ate up the streetcars. And so as I was learning this history about how actually popular opinion had turned against the streetcars long before the systems themselves got scrapped, um, I started to wonder about, well, what, what was it about the streetcars that people didn't like? I mean, it's in part easy to see what would have been an advantage or an advance about private vehicles. I mean, we do tend to be pretty into new technological advancements. I mean, that's still happening today. So you can see why there was some appeal in cars, people had more freedom of mobility, all that stuff. But the reality is, there was also this issue of racial tension and racial segregation and integration that was happening with mass transit systems. So if you look at the really legendary case um, where the Supreme Court decided that separate but equal was an okay way to handle things, um, Plessy v. Ferguson, that case is actually about riding a train and whether you could have uh, separate passenger cars for black and white passengers. Uh, so what I started finding with streetcar systems is that that same tension was present there. So um, when I was doing a presentation yesterday with uh, city employees and mentioned the streetcar thing, I showed that picture of an Austin streetcar, a wonderful woman came up to me after the presentation and said, you know, actually at the Austin History Center right now, they have an exhibit up about streetcars. So I made my way over there yesterday afternoon and found that they have a whole, I don't think you can see it very well on this slide, but they have a whole section that's about um, tension over segregation on the streetcars here in Austin. So the text of this gray box over here says, Austin passed an ordinance in March 1906 requiring the separation of white and colored passengers on streetcars. African-American businessmen and pastors organized a boycott a network of carriages and wagons driven by African Americans offering reduced fares was established as an alternative form of transportation for those participating in the boycott. The boycott lasted about three months. African Americans were riding the streetcars again by the time the ordinance took effect and the passengers divided and the passenger dividers installed. By 1907, Texas state law reflected the local ordinance and required all streetcars to comply with the separate coach law applied to trains in 1889. This was later applied to the motor buses that would replace the streetcars as well. So when we're talking about streetcar history beyond going, oh my gosh, what a big mistake we made getting rid of these wonderful mass transit systems and replacing them with the private automobile system that's very oil dependent and has been a big part of our um, you know, issues around overconsumption of, of resources and fossil fuels and stuff like that here in the US. We should also be talking about race. We should be talking about how uh, the attitudes of the time were being uh, expressed and reflected in transit systems. Um, this wasn't just something that was going on in terms of where people were choosing to live or what kind of jobs or education they had access to. It was also present in how they got around their cities and where they could go and all that kind of stuff. So um, as I started to see how that history was part of the story of transportation in Los Angeles, it really seemed even more so like, gosh, we should be talking about this in bicycling. If we wanna look toward a future where there are more people riding bikes or seeing you know, that as a sustainable transportation option, um, we gotta consider how this kind of uh, racism or discrimination or segregation has been part of um, our history. 
And then this is another picture from the uh, current exhibit. The Austin History Center is really cool. It's in this beautiful old library. You can just walk in and show yourself around. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so I think the streetcars ended up coming out here in 1940. It said something about the last, uh, last lines being turned into scrap for the war effort. So it was kind of like a patriotic thing to just finish off getting rid of this outdated system. So if you, again, leave aside the race component in the, in the kind of narrative of where we went wrong with transportation in the 20th century, the story is, you know, we made this huge mistake, the auto industry really forced cars on the public, and then we started spending all these public resources on huge amounts of highways and expanded street projects so that those cars would be accommodated. And so then that takes us to where we are today, which is having it deeply embedded both in our culture and in our planning processes that um, private vehicles should get the, the lion's share of what resources are available and who has priority. Uh, in spaces, even in places where, you know, by law that's not true, um, culturally it's still the practice that once you're behind uh, the wheel of a car, you kind of feel like you're a pretty important person, you should be allowed to go where you want. So uh, if you then add the discussion about race back into this landscape, if you look at an image like this, you don't just see the highways where you have the cars using fossil fuels circulating, you also see the neighborhoods that are divided up by these kinds of pieces of infrastructure. And um, I didn't have the opportunity to do too much research about redlining in Austin, but my cursory search tells me there's a lot of good information out there about how uh, transportation systems were part of inscribing, you know, this is where some people can live, this is where other people can live, and how that plays out in terms of urban, urban development even today. So um, again, lots of good evidence for how we should be thinking about race as a component and, and these histories that we want to move on from of racial discrimination as part of our transportation systems uh, if we want to make them more sustainable. And then uh, this is just a slide that is talking about the result of that huge investment in private vehicle infrastructure, which is that, you know, getting around outside of a car is considered not ideal. Um, so I just did a, a random Google search on um, I hate the bus, and this was something that came up like a, a marketing company that uh, has some stuff like, you know, the one thing I hate about riding the bus is everything. Uh, more side effects of this mode of transportation include being in a state of perpetual lateness, smelling like other people's poor food choices, and listening to cell phone conversations that no amount of Beyonce will ever drown out. So, um, you know, it, I think it's pretty common knowledge that there's a strong bias toward using public transit um, in this country. So what was interesting for me to learn as I was, uh, again, doing this research on the history of transportation in Los Angeles and what are the intersections with race and class was that in the 90s, people started organizing around using transit as a civil rights issue. So, I mean, there's a history of that in terms of, again, transit spaces always being where the segregation questions were playing out. Um, in 1956, with the Montgomery bus boycott, you had as a, a, a very important action within the civil rights movement, people uh, fighting against uh, the idea of people who were black having to sit at the back of the bus and Rosa Parks' story and all that. Um, but it wasn't until the 90s that um, groups of transit riders themselves started organizing and saying, you know, we have a right to get around our cities and we should also be able to have a say in how transit authorities are spending money, where they're uh, investing in systems, where they're not investing in systems. So in LA, we happen to have a very prominent uh, story of a transit riders union called the Bus Riders Union that in a lot of ways like created the model that then got used around the country. Um, so I happened to go to a bus riders union meeting uh, very early in my field work and again was like, all right, so pretty much people have already figured out this whole right to get around the city thing. We just have to bring this into the bike movement. 
there's already this organized, you know, network of groups around the country and around our region of people who are promoting bicycling. And then we've already got all these people who are highlighting the uh, ways that racial and social justice intersect with transportation. Let's just bring that stuff together. But it turned out to be a little bit more challenging than that. Um, again, for people who, um, it just kind of seemed like people who were coming from an experience of being um, a woman, a person of color, queer, somehow having a, a, a sense of marginalized identity, we were able to see those linkages pretty well. But in the mainstream bike movement or the mainstream bike world, there was some, there was some, discomfort around um, looking at these issues of race and class. And so when I finished my PhD in 2013, I shifted from working um, kind of more with grassroots groups and in my academic work on this concept of bike justice and took a job with the League of American Bicyclists in Washington, D.C. as the manager of their equity initiative. So then for the next two years, I got to help create this concept of bike equity and examine what did that mean, how uh, were conversations about transportation equity taking shape both at the national level and around the country. And because I had been doing research on uh, questions of transportation justice and, and bringing that race and class stuff into the transportation space, um, I paid a lot of attention to how this term equity uh, seemed less scary to some folks than the term justice did. And so it was, it was fascinating to be uh, collaborating on reports or doing interviews with people around the country, going to conferences, stuff like that, talking about bike equity and recognizing how for some people uh, who were maybe more concerned about getting into a, a tough conversation or, or weren't really sure how to handle it, to say bike equity was a sort of nod in the direction of, yes, mistakes have been made. I'm not really that comfortable talking about those mistakes or trying to figure out how to change things, but mistakes have been made. But then in the same, you know, we could use the same term to talk about things way over on the side of, oh my gosh, you know, white supremacy is an issue in the bike movement, just like it's an issue in many other areas of uh, urban concern. So uh, one of the things that I got to work on while I was at the League was a history project where we looked at how uh, this bike equity idea uh, had taken shape over the years and what were the roots of talking about race and racism within bicycling. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar with the, the history of bicycling in this country, basically it was... Um, in the 1890s, we had the first bicycle boom. So that was when bicycles first started to be uh, more broadly available. But they weren't available at a, at a mass scale. They didn't have the mass production part of it figured out yet. So to have a bicycle was a status symbol. Um, it was something that was really only accessible to uh, uh, elites. So it's kind of like, um, I was saying yesterday, it's kind of like the equivalent of a Tesla today. That's what having a bike was like. Um, except without the like eco smug thing because they weren't thinking about that back then. But if you look at representations of bicycling back in the 1890s, there's a, actually quite a bit of um, race and class inflected stuff in that media. So um, there was a, a, a lot of uh, dislike of this attitude of the entitled bicyclist who, you know, thought that he could just zip through the city, cutting around workmen's carts and things like that. Um, a lot of cities had ordinances saying that you couldn't ride a bicycle in the park because bicyclists were seen as such a menace. Um, and then on the other hand, because bicycles were uh, associated with more elite whites, there was also this idea that um, it would be inappropriate for someone who wasn't white to ride a bicycle. So I found this set of um, caricatures that was called I think Dark Town Cycling, that was put out by Courier and Ives, which we all know from the holiday song. Uh, so they, you know, were printmakers back in the day. And the joke in this series was, oh my gosh, can you imagine darkies on bicycles? What are they thinking? How uppity is that? So um, 
it was it was <laughs> good to have the opportunity to to find some of this history and share it with um, a broader audience. So this was included in a, a poster project we shared at the National Bike Summit in 2014. So in working on bike equity, in addition to surfacing, you know, this kind of stuff that was um, just out there to to be discussed and to provide as education. Um, I also was working on creating a broad network of people around the country who wanted to talk about these kinds of issues. So I started an email list in 2013 called the Bike Equity Network, which is something that um, still exists today. And um, it's a place where people who work in planning or advocacy or you know, are promoting some local project can talk to each other about uh, these kind of inequity issues um, in bicycling. In uh, the fall of 2014, we held a conference called Future Bike, where uh, for the first time, um, the League of American Bicyclists hosted a one-day conference that was focused specifically on uh, bicycling and communities of color and what kinds of issues were being faced. And these elephants are from an exercise we created for that, where to start the day, we said, What's the elephant in the room? What's the thing that you're always noticing or thinking about when you're in bike spaces, but you feel like you can't talk about it, or when you talk about it, people react like you're saying something wrong or, or threatening. Um, so everybody wrote out what their elephant was, and then we had a wall covered with um, elephants. So this elephant with the sunglasses says uh, inclusivity, and then there's some other stuff. And then this elephant says socioeconomic status, stuff like that. Um, so through having these kind of conversations, both online and in conference spaces, uh, there started to be sort of a, a, a shared understanding of something we were working towards. And it started actually to be less about bicycling um, because there was something that happened in 2014 that uh, was really pivotal for my thinking about mobility and public space, which was the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so in 2014, as you know, we probably all recall, there were a number of very high profile cases where um, justice wasn't served or something just you know, tragically egregious had happened that involved the body of um, a young black person who was walking, just occupying public space uh, and ended up dead. So uh, the Black Lives Matter movement was, you know, for the first time in, my adult lifetime um, that I can recall drawing a huge amount of public attention to this issue of racialized violence and the kind of insecurity that um, black communities and especially black men and boys carry with them as they're traveling around. And for some of us working on bike equity, we were like, yeah, okay, this is this is part of what we're dealing with. How are we gonna talk about bike safety and people being able to travel safely in their neighborhoods if we're not gonna talk about the fact that sometimes the color of skin of the person riding that bicycle has more to do with their safety than whether there's a bike lane or a cycle track or any kind of design issues. So um, we created through the League of American Bicyclists a little project that um, there's a card from up here in the corner called Seeing and Believing, where through the Bike Equity Network, we solicited um, quotes and ideas from people around the country on uh, you know, what, what was the connection that they saw between street safety and um, race issues. And so this quote uh, is from a guy in LA named Miguel Ramos. The policing of communities of color has always had a large impact on how we get around our communities. And so our, our effort with this project was to just put it out there. That's why it was called Seeing and Believing. Just what I was uh, noticing at that point in time was that there was still this strong sense of division in the bike world about whether these kinds of inequity issues were relevant to the project of uh, bicycling or sustainable transportation or not. And so through projects like this, the, the hope was that by simply laying it out there, just showing what was there, that you know we could start to move toward more of a consensus that this stuff was happening, this was real in people's lives, and that it was relevant to what we were working on. Um, unfortunately, that got to be just 
too much of a lift for me personally to be doing that kind of advancement work within the bike world itself. And um, I quit working at the League of American Bicyclists at the beginning of 2015. By the end of that year, I was back in Los Angeles and um, wrote a post that uh, I've gotten a lot of uh, feedback about over the years about Vision Zero programs. Um, because one of the things I witnessed when I was working in DC was um, a resistance to incorporating this focus on racialized violence and policing that the Black Lives Matter movement was bringing up, a resistance to incorporating that into um, Vision Zero and the approach to street safety that's designed in those programs. Um, and I won't go into that too much now. We can talk about it more in the Q&A if folks are interested. But basically, with Vision Zero safety programs, um, one of the pillars that they've included in the US model is law enforcement. And so it, it, if you're going to adopt a Vision Zero policy that has law enforcement as one of its strategies for increasing street safety, you're opening a big can of worms in terms of um, both histories of uh, racialized violence and uh, discrimination in policing and you know, in terms of where organizing is today. And so um, it, was, it was hard as someone who really strongly personally identified with bicycling. I mean, I've got a bike tattoo. I called myself a bike anthropologist, bikey, bikey, bike, to realize that um, there were, you know, the, the leadership in the bike advocacy community was pretty OK with just basically going on a different track than where a lot of social and racial justice movements were, were starting to move. Um, and we can see that today. I think that that movement has been coalescing even more in terms of the fight um, against climate change and efforts to find a uh, common cause between the movements uh, against the persecution of immigrants and against mass incarceration and, and all these different things that are going on. So. I was out of there, no more bike equity work for me. So since 2016, I have been part of projects that have moved beyond a focus on one mode of transportation. Um, so we're not just talking about biking, we're not just talking about transit, uh, but really this whole landscape of mobility. And again, what is going on when we're traveling that has to do with the identities that we inhabit, um, the structural inequalities that we have experienced, things like that. And uh, so a project that got started in 2016 um, is a collective called The Untokening. And the name of The Untokening, if it's not uh, super obvious to you already, is a reference to the fact that for uh, those of us who um, have a lived experience of being part of some kind of marginalized community, uh, usually there are multiple times in our uh, advocacy and professional lives where we've been invited to a work group or a committee or to speak on a panel or you know somehow come be a representative. And we then find when we come into those spaces, even when they're well-intentioned, um, that sometimes there's really not that much openness around uh, sharing new ideas. Um, and so that's the experience of being tokenized. When you realize, oh, I'm here to be a token, you know, fill in the blank, people aren't expecting me to, you know, have fresh ideas or come at this from a, a new perspective that might um, lead to some changes. So we were, we had really encountered uh, through work across the spectrum in active transportation a resistance to, uh, to letting us be part of the strategy work. Um, you know, a lot of people had been in jobs where they were working on diversity within an organization or they were at a very um, low level within the organization as an organizer or something. And we we're encountering this uh, barrier to really getting to be part of uh, decision making and shaping, you know, what the what the strategic work um, of advocacy was going to be. So we wanted to have our own conversation. So that's where the untokening came from. It was like, hey, we're not seeing each other as much anymore because we're not working for those organizations we used to work for. Uh, but we still think we have this cool, you know, shared set of values. Uh, why don't we have a conference and see what comes out of it? So we had um, the first untokening convening in Atlanta in November 2016. And that was basically a day of group conversations with a ton of note taking 
And um, what we did with the material from that was created what we call the 1.0 principles of mobility justice. Um, so the process we went through was taking this, you know, rich, rich set of uh, documented conversations and a team of folks, including myself, who had a background in writing and editing, just worked on kind of seeing what were the common themes, what were the, the words that kept coming up, what were the, what were the, the stuff that was at the heart of um, our shared conversation. And so I have a partial copy of the 1.0 Principles of Mobility Justice here that we're going to let folks take a look at. And the idea with these is that we didn't, we didn't want to create a, a checklist. We didn't want to create a document that was going to um, shut down conversations or be an endpoint, kind of like a how do you make things more equitable or more just, okay, just do what's on you know this, this sheet of paper. We wanted to create something that was going to be more of a conversation starter. So we were intentionally um, provocative and uh, hoped that we would be setting out some ideas that would push uh, push for more uh, intersectional conversation and connection and relationship building across issue areas related to mobility. Um, now in Los Angeles, where I moved back in 2015, that project that I'd been part of um, back in 2008, City of Lights, had continued on um, under a new name. It had become Multicultural Communities for Mobility. It split off from the LA County Bicycle Coalition um, for the same reason that a lot of people were starting to talk about mobility justice in terms of wanting to have a broader focus on transportation and not just looking at, at one mode. So um, Multicultural Communities for Mobility, or MCM, invited me to be on their advisory board um, in 2016. And this past year, we started going through a strategic planning process that led to actually rebranding ourselves as People for Mobility Justice. And it has been super fun to get to be part of a project um, well, two projects, one project that's talking about mobility justice more in this, um, you know, we are a collective of professionals who do peer support and peer learning and stuff like that nationally, that's the untokening. And then with People for Mobility Justice, we're a local community-based organization in LA that's trying to put this stuff into practice and figure out, okay, how do you go from all this stuff is related to what's happening when people travel to actually shifting the way we're doing policy at the local transit authority or with the planning department. So um, I want to show another video that is about where people for mobility justice uh, came from and uh, where we're going, because I think it illustrates this mobility justice idea.
holding those institutions, those politicians, those decision makers accountable. Now with the Control Mobility Justice, we're really looking at creating our own table. And if I even go to our table, so that we can authentically see what it is to actually implement equity into the work. That, that spirit and that authenticity is something that is rarely seen out there. And it's something that I think could never be Uh, so it was pretty fun for me when we were redesigning our website this past year to do some digging into the history of the project and going back to that City of Lights stuff. And that's when I revisited that video I'd made back in 2009. And I'm, I'm loving the way that those two videos show um, the growth of that one project. I feel a lot of, a lot of proud, uh, pride to be part of PMJ. So... Those are a couple of the projects that I'm part of that are working on creating this mobility justice conversation uh, in the US. And I want to go ahead and get a little bit more academic uh, at the tail end here and talk about how, you know, uh, it, when you shift your perspective on um, what the factors are that shape somebody's trip as they're moving through the city, then you can end up coming with some different sol solutions than um, what are currently out there. So one of the, one of the first things that I learned uh, when I was studying anthropology from my BA on upwards was that anthropologists understand space, you know, the, the, the space we inhabit, as uh, very contested, you know, there are different people who are having basically different worlds going on at the same time in the same spaces, which is, you know, a lot to wrap your head around. And um, for me, one of the things that was so fascinating about studying street spaces is you can really see conflict in action people coming in with different um, abilities in terms of what vehicles they're in for speed, for harm, uh, different expectations of how they should be treated by those around them, all that kind of stuff. So um, when I got involved in uh, bicycle advocacy projects, I learned that for many bicycle advocates, their idea, like their theory of change in terms of how we were gonna get more people biking really had to do with the built environment. It was like, people are driving because we invested so much money in infrastructure for cars. And if we shifted to investing money in infrastructure for bikes, then people would bike more. And it seemed like there was something missing from that equation to me. And, and as I was doing my research in um, anthropology, I found um, this way of looking at what's happening as people move through space that is more complicated than that. And so the way, um, researchers like me would see it is, you know, someone who's out there, like you could refer to as a bicyclist or a driver or a pedestrian. What's really going on is you got some kind of body with some kind of abilities, some kind of gender, some kind of all that stuff. They're traveling with some kind of vehicle, either their own feet, a wheelchair, a mountain bike, a, you know, a Lamborghini, whatever, some kind of vehicle. And they're traveling through some kind of environment. And that environment reflects um, histories of investment and disinvestment and you know who's been allowed to be there and who hasn't been allowed to be there and all that kind of stuff. And what that all adds up to is really different for different people. And so this, for me, has been helpful in terms of being able to say, well, there are multiple entry points. If we want to change what that trip is like, you could start with changing what vehicles people have access to. You could start with changing who those people are that you're you know, trying to attract out there and market to or design for. You could change the design of the built environment. And when the vehicles and the environments are the starting point, which is really the typical approach in transportation planning, uh, we get to this set of outcomes that really has to do with infrastructure and physical projects. It's like, you know, let's hire planning firms to redesign streetscapes. Let's uh, contract to get bike share or scooter share in our cities. 
But when people are the starting point, when you're looking at all the diversity that's contained in the actual individuals who are out there traveling, then you get to different questions. And what we're really working on now uh, at People for Mobility Justice and through the untokening is how can we figure out a way to improve transportation and create models that will help us to invest in safety and economic opportunity in those local neighborhoods that um, unfortunately have had a very hard time benefiting from these kinds of changes. Um, we all know about the issues with gentrification and displacement and how when we put a big public investment in improving a public space that's going to have other kinds of effects in terms of uh, who can afford to remain there. So um, a project that I'm really excited to be part of with People for Mobility Justice is experimenting um, over the next two years with a black owned bike shop in a neighborhood in LA called Lamert Park around um, what it would take to create a mobility hub. So, um, you know, the bike shop is probably the most uh, viable model out there for how to create an, an economic uh, center in terms of mobility. But if we think beyond bicycling, what are the services that could be provided at a mobility hub? Um, how would youth and elders in the neighborhood have employment opportunities? And what, what, what needs to happen so that you could create something that um, a public agency would feel was a viable investment? And so um, what's exciting to me about that model is that it cuts out the infrastructure as a middleman in some ways. Instead of saying the way to make the people in this neighborhood safer is to redesign their streets, and so putting the money into redesigning the street and then having those safety benefits possibly accrue to the people who are there if they can afford to remain there. This other strategy would be going, how do we make things safer for people in this neighborhood? We pay them directly so that young people and older people have access to jobs and have reasons to be out and about. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of figuring out what is that model or set of models or whatever, but um, I wanted to share this approach to human infrastructure as you know, what we're talking about when we're looking for um, other, other models that can be invested in to make streets safer besides um, just infrastructure projects or physical projects that are gonna go to companies that possibly don't have that local economic benefit. Um, so one thing that I should have sent around earlier is a new popular education project that we are just about to release from people for mobility justice, where as this mobility justice conversation has been developing, it can be very broad and it can be challenging for folks to know uh, what exactly are you talking about or what's my entry point? So our team created this set of playing cards to share different moments or pieces of history that we think are important to uh, the scope of what's within mo uh, mobility justice. Um, so these are our, our mobility justice playing cards you can take a look at. And um, now I would be super curious to hear what kinds of efforts are happening in Austin to forge connections across different issue areas with transportation and community safety um, and other stuff going on or just general questions you have. And thank you so much for being here and listening to me on this Saturday morning. Oh yeah, I have website links, there we go. Thank you. Am I on? Ah, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, before we get into Q and A, I wanted to have Shafan Otero stand up, and this this talk was really her making and her work with Aura, who's a local um, transit um, advocacy group. So uh, thank you so much for bringing this topic um, to the Imagine Austin Speaker Series. I'm excited to see Siobhan in person. We've been like emailing and talking on the phone for almost two years now, I think. So yeah, oh, excited to see you. I can bring a mic around to people who have questions. First question. Or 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, ambitiously enough, it's all of it. You know, we are both trying to have a presence, and I mean, we have, we've had some presence in the more uh, policy and planning spaces in LA for a number of years, but um, this year we are actually devoting more of our staff time to that, to really getting to be part of various committees, participating in coalitions, um, that kind of stuff. And what's exciting to me about that is it has been developing in partnership with state level organizations that want to work on this, uh, you know, big organizing question of how do you get those really local needs represented in the state level process? Because in terms of funding and what kind of projects can be happening, they got levers up at the state level that can open up much bigger resource streams than what's happening locally. Um, so with that, with an eye to, you know, how can we both be advancing um, these concerns within the local stuff in LA, but also looking toward maybe some state level policy down the line that'll uh, get funding out to the kinds of projects um, that we're innovating. We're gonna be putting more time into that this year. Um, our, our, our really, our mainstay thing, the reason why, you know, I think this organization has been able to be around for a decade now is that we have a very strong core um, team of uh, bike safety educators who do bilingual classes. So um, that, you know, even during dry spells over the years where um, the group didn't have capacity to be participating in as many policy conversations or, you know, taking on local projects, uh, we were always, you know, out there in the community doing those classes and, you know, representing um, uh, mobility in that way. And so that has allowed us to stay more connected to community concerns on the ground. So what we're really trying to work on now with our, like, renewed, you know, excitement around having a new name and being all mobility justice, look at us, we're so innovative, is, you know, Keeping, keeping our local on the ground approach going um, and doing programming that engages um, youth and elders in particular and creating what we call the hood planner certification to figure out what is our model for getting people who have been pretty outside the planning process engaged in uh, at least knowing some of the technical vocabulary and being able to interpret, you know, when there are these proposals out there for transportation investment in their neighborhood, being able to, to know, you know, which way is up and, and how to assess whether it's a good thing um, from where they're coming from. So, um, so yeah, so we're trying, we're trying to encompass both that grassroots level and the staying in the policy conversations level. Uh, and we're not alone in doing that in LA. There's a lot of groups that, um, you know, since we, uh, have a strong history of uh, immigrant communities, uh, you know, communities of color uh, across the landscape in Los Angeles. There's a whole bunch of community-based organizations out there who are doing that same kind of um, dance of how do we stay committed to uplifting those really local needs, but also have the connections we need to make stuff move in the policy arena. and. I don't think it's easy. I mean, we've observed a lot of partners who, you know, don't always do it right, um, don't always keep the community's trust and all that, um, but we are hoping to, you know, try our hand at it and see how it goes. Hi. Hi, thanks for coming. I did watch a few of your videos. And so I would just ask you to speak to your personal background. I think you were in the cemetery and doing something with your sister, finding your roots and things of that sort. If you could just speak to how your background actually informs the work that you do. And then also if you could speak about mobility justice, are you speaking pro bikes? I know you've done talks where sometimes you say, I'm not here to get you to ride the bike. So today it sounds like you are trying to get people to ride the bike. So I'm just <laughs> wanting to know, and, and maybe it just is a different audience. So you just spin it a little differently. But if you could also speak to buses and bikes and it's fitting that you're on this side of town. And before you leave, I would ask you to go to our hub. That's no longer really a hub, North Lamar Transit Center, because there's only one partial 15 minute bus on this side of town. And so I would just 
I, I know that's a whole lot to unpack, mm -hmm. but I just want you to know that one of the concerns we have on the northeast side, uh, which is where you are now, is the lack of a network, the lack of bus um, frequency, which exists 15 and 30 minutes on the other sides of town, southwest and central. So how you get communities to wake up and not deny those inequities that people of color do see that are truly in existence. Thank mm -hmm. you. That's great. Uh, I love that set of questions. I'm actually going to, I'll talk about my background, um, but I'm going to put it back to you to tell us about the buses and bikes piece because I, I don't know locally how that goes, but I, I'll just say before that, um, that, you know, I mentioned the bus riders union and transit rider unions. Uh, the work that we're doing now with mobility justice is still in development because there is a huge, um, lack of trust and need for relationship building across the kind of biking, walking, active transportation advocacy world and the transit advocacy world. The transit advocacy world has done a fantastic job of being more responsive to the needs, not only of um, low income communities and those core riders, but also individuals with disabilities who you know have particular uh, mobility needs that um, you know the our, our local um, governments are responsible for serving and, and all that kind of stuff so we have given that historic lack of trust which has a lot to do with you know the race of who's been involved in those conversations um, folks like me and others who are involved with the untokening and people for mobility justice have tried to you know move forward with care in terms of not attempting to make it certainly not make it all about bikes but i totally get why it would come across that way because for a lot of people in this country if you say bikes the image that comes to their mind is not that you know undocumented immigrant who is riding a broken machine that you know he's afraid might get stolen because it's his only mobility device they're thinking of lance armstrong and i don't think lance armstrong is a transit advocate I would guess, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to speak to getting where you're coming from and, um, and I totally do change up the you know, messaging. Even the folks who heard my presentation yesterday, they saw some of the same, a lot of the same material in a slightly different order and, and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, so buses and bikes, what's been the, the issue here? So I won't be long-winded because I'm that Title VI advocate and I'm always at the CAP Metro board meetings. So I'm just gonna give you a example that I use with Council Member Kitchen all the time, <laughs> which is there's a bus route in Southwest Austin that only serves 2.9 boardings an hour. And then you have the bus that runs to the northeast side here. It serves 120 boardings an hour every 60 minutes, but the 2.9 boardings an hour is every 30 minutes. It goes against all of the goals of Capital Metro's remap, which is CAP remap. Basically, it was supposed to be density and growth and things of that sort, ridership, and the consultant told them, Russ Chisholm on November 7th, 2016, that it was in low density area, it was watershed restriction, and it was not gonna grow ridership. So you have to ask the question when you talk about trust, why is it that that empty 40 foot bus continues to operate every 30 minutes until nearly midnight, where you have the people who need the bus the most, 120 boardings a day, the daily boardings have to wait 60 minutes. That's the historically black neighborhoods that it's going to. The bus move to the highway. So when you talk about Vision Zero and Cap Metro's board taking the pledge back in August 22nd, 2016, and then you put the buses in areas that are not safe, you then have to ask what is the commitment, and then you don't look at the growth to get people to the jobs that you mentioned on Parmer Lane which is Samsung, Dell, 3M moving by 2019, Apple on the west side, and Amazon too, and then you don't look at getting people to the jobs, that's problematic, and so the trust issue is there. You have Title VI, and I appreciate you talking about Los Angeles Bus Riders Union. I'm also familiar with Beaver Creek. That was a four-year quest in Ohio for the people to get to and from the mall. Three bus stops. It took $50,000, the council opposed them, and so here in Austin, it's been opposition to Title VI where it's just been, well, the Federal Transit Administration said we did a good job, but the Federal Transit Administration requires them to look at race and to make sure that there's not a disproportionate impact on a group of individuals, disparate impact. 
whereas Cap Metro keeps telling us we're looking at ridership, we're looking at the numbers. And so I won't go much further than that, other than to say it's Title VI, it's a disparate impact issue, and the board and the CEO and even the advocates uh, on the other side of the aisle are wanting us to believe that 60 minutes is new and improved for us all, but they've never proposed 60 minutes in the southwest side to serve any of the white constituents, those choice riders. Thank you. All right, is there an organization that you're with that, like a website folks go to to learn more and get involved? So there are advocates in the area, and we're just in our own spaces. We come together. Uh, we had the Urban Transportation Commission that passed a resolution to ensure that Title VI was there. You also had um, the Zoning and Platting Commission that wanted an interlocal agreement between the city of Austin and Cap Metro. And so those are allies in their own spaces, and they don't coalesce like a, a big old group like Dr. King where we all go in force, but in their own space, they have advocated for equity as well from the west side to the north and even in the south. And it's been disparate, so our voices aren't heard collectively. You can go to the media and you can see KXAN, or you have the bus routes over here, 240, where it was eliminated to the hospital, where those advocates were. You can look recently, June, August 2018, and you'll see Southeast. Just recently, last week, the people from Southeast Austin are wanting the bus back at Eastside Memorial. So they're in different spaces in the community. I just happen to be that person that knows the system. <laughs> and so they come to me and I'm aware of all of these disparate actions. I'll tell you, uh, from the rich side to the rich side, which is a Mueller to Mopac bus, there's a lady that actually wrote to Campo, the meetings on Monday, that's Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. She's white, she's rich, she's an ally and wants equity, and her information will be in the board backup materials, as will mine, my opposition, of course, with Title VI. So in different ways, we've been able to document and remain vigilant on the Title VI issue. It's just been that <laughs> Cap Metro's been pretty entrenched on selling us the marketing message of more frequent, more reliable, and better connected when it's infrequent, unreliable, and disconnected on this side. So I don't have a website. I have a website, but it's <laughs> educational related. But my advocacy in the Title VI information is in City of Austin, and it's uh, documented in Cap Metro's board minutes and Campo as well. Thank you. All right, well thank you for all that info. And definitely, um, yeah, so if you're not familiar with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, that is a really important piece of, um, uh, the law that is very relevant to these mobility justice conversations. Um, there's also, uh, back in 1994, President Clinton passed, uh, what do they call it, executive order um, on environmental justice that required all of the federal agencies to come up with an environmental justice strategy that was gonna, uh, you know, basically look toward preventing having public investment from the federal level lead to uh, disproportionate impact. This is something that's very much under attack at the moment with our current um, executive administration, but really important information to be aware of. So there's Title VI, and um, you know, if you look at the U.S. Department of Transportation website, you can see what their environmental justice strategy is, and it's, it's all this stuff. It's all making sure that people actually have access to the planning process, making sure that um, you know, there's not the, the benefits and burdens being disproportionately distributed, all that kind of stuff. So it's already, it is on the books, but unfortunately it has been a matter of um, local folks getting organized and, and holding public agencies accountable. So did you get to see a video of me visiting a cemetery with my sister? Because that's something I do. I'm like into visiting cemeteries that I have ancestors buried in, but. We have a question on the side of the room when, when we're I done with this topic. Thank you. For your, your sister to answer the question, because I don't want to dominate the conversation, but it's, I think it's the audio, so there's like this oh. vi this image, it's kind of like a podcast, uh -huh. and I think you were looking for your indigenous roots. Okay. And so your sister's talking you through the cemetery, and you're looking for your ancestry, uh -huh. or ancestors rather, uh -huh. and then she, you're looking, she's looking at the map, she, she's kind of telling you where your people are, yeah. and then you're uncovering it. So you were just talking about looking white but not being white, and then the different parts of you mm -hmm. and how that impacts the different spaces you are and how you're received. And so I just found that fascinating that your anthropological journey from an academic perspective also influences how people actually see you physically when you're speaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
great comments. We have a question over here, and, and, and just to add some commentary, um, this is Imagine Austin speaker series from, from the city of Austin, and we appreciate all the questions and comments um, that we're hearing here uh, today, but from, as I spoke earlier in the introduction, from the, from the standpoint of updating our city's transportation plan and really uh, doing an effort, a focused effort in hearing underrepresented voices, you know, we were all aware of all of the issues that were brought up with, with Title VI and, and did work closely with Capital Metro to make sure we were in compliance with, with the federal, federal um, guidelines, laws, et cetera, and uh, have moved forward together with what we're recommending um, in the future plans for Cap Metro and Austin Strategic Mobility Plan, recognizing that we are taking an equity lens, um, and it's not easy. There's a lot of trade-offs that we have to do with any type of plan that we do uh, with the city of Austin. So I just wanted to mention that we are aware of those issues and have, have um, heard um, um, from speakers throughout the planning process over the last few years and appreciate their time and effort in, in coming and speaking during those processes. But there is a question on the side of the room. Yeah, I have a, just a couple of comments in response to some of the things already said, and then uh, then I have a question. I, was, I don't want you to leave here with the wrong impression, uh, because these issues are, are, of course, very, very complicated. Uh, Any time, of course, you're going to make significant changes to any kind of service, you know, there, there's going to be challenges and they'll be imperfect. But I, I for one, am really pleased to see uh, throughout all of our transportation discussions more and more of a focus uh, on equity and access. Uh, so the changes that were referenced earlier to our bus service, uh, you know, essentially what happened was there were six frequent service bus routes in the city. And uh, recent changes took that number up to 14. And the system-wide impact of those changes, there's about, uh, about half of the population in, in uh, the area served by our transit service are people of color, about 500,000 plus people. Before the changes, there were about 15% of those 500,000 people who were within a 10 minute walk of frequent high quality transit service. And that number is now up to about 30%. Uh, when you look at households in poverty, uh, there's about 26,000 households in poverty uh, who were being served by our transit system. And about 15% uh, of those, excuse me, 15% of those uh, households uh, were being uh, were within 10 minutes of frequent service, and that number is now up to 30% uh, as well. So, you know, system-wide, I think uh, the recent changes were actually a very big step forward in equity and access to opportunity via transit, but certainly not perfect, and we need to do more. And people need to continue to hold everyone accountable to continuing to make progress. But we also, I think, uh, should give credit where it's due uh, when big steps like that are taken. But we need to continue to keep the, uh, the, the pressure on. But my, my question uh, is really about a city like Austin. What are the other communities out there that you think are doing a really good job of integrating these types of uh, principles? Allergies, that's something you'll learn about here if you stay much longer. Uh, if integrating these principles into their plan. Good question. Um, well, it sounds like y'all have a lively conversation going on about <laughs> transit services and what equity means within those transit services, so I'm glad. All right, I hit, a, hit a good spot. Um, in terms of cities that are doing a good job, I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot of challenges to making transit work better in cities. I mean, obviously the whole limited resources element is huge and so much of it has to do with, again, that very long standing bias we have in this country toward using public transit. So we do not have a consensus in any city that I'm aware of besides New York City and even they have tons of problems funding their transit system and keeping it in good, um, condition, we don't agree that transit's a good use of public resources. So I think that's where the change work needs to happen. We need to do more to get on the same page that actually 
it is a good use of resources to make sure that more people have access to uh, frequent and quality transit services. So, you know, I don't think that's something you achieve simply through system changes. Um, so in LA, for example, our uh, transit authority Metro has been in the unpleasant situation recently of having expanded their rail network considerably, invested huge amounts of money, and ridership keeps going down. So it's not a matter of access necessarily, it's a matter of cultural preference or you know other factors that might be shaping why people are using transit or not. So I think that there's more we need to do in the cultural space around what, what is the value of transit and why should we be investing in that? Because when it gets to the agency level of you know these spending decisions and and you know having to weigh the various outcomes, um, you know just from what I've witnessed uh, in the different cities I've lived in, which would be L.A., Portland, Seattle, Washington D.C., there is not a shared understanding of the goal. Um, for folks who are working at a transit agency versus people who are riding transit. And I don't know that that's something that can be fixed within the transit agency, you know, and that's a big ask of the transit agency to somehow, you know, turn everybody in the region into a champion of transit. But that is, I think, the work that needs to be done. So I'm not like, I can't think of a city that is doing that particular kind of work because that's not how transit agencies approach the problem. Um, and again, that's, that's, that's the kind of answer you're gonna get from me about any of these questions as an anthropologist is like, it's culture. We gotta change the culture. Um, but I really do think that, you know, we are, we are letting this culture shift happen at a glacial pace in terms of, you know, younger people not getting driver's licenses at the same levels and, um, you know, preferences slowly shifting over time toward not having to uh, own a private vehicle. But, um, I think there's a lot more we could do to, to stir the pot and really confront the race and class bias that's embedded in uh, people not wanting to ride the bus. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, your choice of which question to answer. I've got two questions, and I don't want to dominate the conversation. But one, if you were you know, in charge of a transit agency or transportation department, what kind of goals would you set generically you know, to try to accomplish in that? Uh, role or two, do you have any tips for dealing uh, with like um, policy conversations in white dominated spaces? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick on the transit theme just because, uh, you know, I think that's uh, what we're talking about in the room. Let's see. Well, something that uh, I think is super fascinating is how this transit bias is so strong that even people who are transit operators hate the bus and don't want to be, you know, riding the bus. Like, I remember uh, interviewing a woman in Seattle. Uh, I, I did this project called the Seattle Bike Justice Project back in, um, like, 2012, where uh, I talked to people who were community leaders in communities of color in Seattle about bicycling. I was like, all right, here are people who have, like, a proven track record of caring deeply about um, their communities and, you know, working. Uh, for change within the city, what do they think about bikes? And it was really interesting. I think more more people should take on projects like that if you actually want to find out more about the image of uh, a bicycling that a lot of people have in mind. But one of the people I interviewed was an African American woman whose mother was a transit operator, and I I didn't even talk to her mom, but this woman just you know uh, made it so clear that like nobody in her family would ever ride the bus. You know, like she would go pick up her mom at the, you know, whatever bus operations center when she was done with work because it was just like nobody in that family was gonna ride the bus. But being a bus operator or a transit operator historically because it's a unionized space has been like a good job, um, pathway to the middle class kind of role. But so if I were in charge of a transit agency, I would be trying to have a conversation there. Like how do we get what, what would it take to get our transit operators to actually think it was a good idea for their families to ride the bus? What does it take to get 
upwardly mobile or middle class uh, people of color to think it's a good idea because that's where so much of the bias is held. The bias that is in uh, white middle class communities toward transit, it seems like people are more willing in those spaces to get the whole eco element like, oh, okay, yeah, all right, sure, reducing traffic, blah, blah, blah. But when you're coming from a community of color where riding the bus has been like part of your burden, you know, part of what has shown that you are a second class citizen, those are the places where we actually need to figure out what would it take. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know what it would take, but yeah, if I were in charge of a transit agency, that's the question I'd be asking. We're gonna go to a question to Siobhan. Hey, Adonia, so excited to finally meet you. Glad this talk happened. Um, so I love how you uh, talked about beyond infrastructure and looking at human infrastructure with mobility justice. And I see some great organizations in the room, um, GAVA, Bike Austin, Aura, and we're all, each one works specifically in their own area, does a great job. Um, and I see how these organizations can facilitate some of the things that you're talking about as um, Austin rolls out its transportation plans. Does PMJ work with other organizations or what are tips you, maybe it's just a matter of getting us all in the same room to talk, but I think that it would be great for the organizations that are transit advocates to work, I think we tend to work in silos for various reasons you've discussed and any tips on how we can collectively work together um, as these transportation plan rolls out to uh, practice mobility justice collectively or as PMJ is doing something like that. Um, yeah, that's my tips on that basically. Yeah, I mean I think uh, there is a lot of work to be done. I mean for us locally with PMJ, you know, we are uh, in some ways between a rock and a hard place and so I'd imagine it's similar here. Like in any advocacy landscape, there's a ton of personality politics. I mean in any landscape that involves humans, there's a ton of personality politics. And you have the, you know, the time seven years ago that she slighted her and so now they don't want to work together. And when it comes to, you know, race and class stuff also being tied up in that, oh my gosh, like the barriers to trust are huge. And that's something we recognize and, and so there are certain strategies we are not taking on as PMJ because we're like, we don't know what to do. Like, we don't know how to play nice with that organization. Ah, ah, maybe it'll become clear over time. So I think starting with an, an internal understanding, like what is that crew of people who have the shared vision or, or concept in mind and working with it needs to happen before the coalition building. Um, and so the, you know, the stronger a sense that group has of what it is they're trying to advance, not in a, not in a we are campaigning for this bill kind of way, but in a values kind of way, um, I think the, then that can inform um, coalition building. But if you're trying to start with a coalition of groups that you know, have their reasons for not always being on the same page, I think that's pretty challenging. Um, so that's that's been our our strategy. Like, let's keep working internally, you know, and and again, finding those partners who aren't in the local scene. So that's why we're working with some state level partners and you know, part of the untokening network around the country, because it's it's uh, it's one of the amazing things of being in this communication age. You can find those people who have that common value or super bizarre interest or whatever it is, and be in dialogue with them. Um, outside of having to deal with the immediate landscape where you come up and say, this is what I see and it makes sense to me, and you might have five people going, that's not, no, uh-uh, we can't talk about that here. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think coalitions are a great goal, but you gotta, you gotta have the space to grow that internal vision before you're putting the pressure on yourself to have everybody get along. We have one question over here, and it is 12 o'clock. We can go another 15, okay. So I'm gonna be that annoying person who's gonna answer your, your question. You asked, you know, what are some of the things that we're seeing in Austin? And one of the things I just learned about yesterday that I was like, wait, this doesn't even make sense from like a justice perspective is, you know, where do we subsidize specific transit systems? And like that, I mean, I think about that a lot, but it was so blatant to me to learn about this yesterday that 
in Austin, um, Austin Energy will give you a $1,200 rebate to install an electric charging station in your home. So you have to be a homeowner, which cuts out, you know, 55% uh, of our population in um, Austin. And then you have to purchase an electric vehicle, which is not cheap. And if you want to purchase an electric bicycle, you can get a $300 rebate on a $2,000 bicycle. So why, don't, why do we not have that parity? Like, if we want to make things equitable, shouldn't we be subsidizing, you know, the more efficient transportation method? It just doesn't make sense, especially when you think about who's purchasing electric vehicles and who's a homeowner. It's probably a certain kind of person. I'm just putting it out there. So I'm interested to you know, kind of continue that conversation. Um, but I think it's really interesting, all the things you said. Um, w all your work, I know you're really focused on the people. Um, do you have a sense of like what you think are like really key policies that can help make that culture change happen? Like, you know, we talked about Title VI being a policy. Like, are there policies you think that cities or governments can adopt that would sort of drive things more in this direction? Yeah, those are um, great questions. Thanks for the uh, insight into what's happening locally. Um, in terms of policies, I, I really, the thing that, that we're experimenting with um, as PMJ and which has surfaced through all the, you know, observation I've done in the last few years around how people are talking about mobility justice really has to do with that local investment. Um, so any policies that are addressing equity in a very traditional sense of what equity means. I mean, equity means an ownership stake. Like, if you're going to build equity, it means first you own something and then it increases in value. So we are, I think a major challenge right now for transportation systems is that um, the, the history of transportation, uh, and this is like a very broad statement, and I'm hoping to do some research in uh, the near future to help kind of make this less abstract, but the history of transportation regulation and spending and, you know, government uh, uh, investment in transportation has really been driven by the transportation industry. Um, like many aspects of how we do public spending in this country, it has very much been shaped by, well, what does the transportation industry have to sell? Um, and so electric vehicles, e-bikes, you know, the, the businesses that are um, operating in this space, it, it has been hard for me as someone who's been working in advocacy for a long time. It took me a, a long time to, to zoom out and get some perspective on the fact that, you know, even if we're talking about addressing climate change and reducing carbon and moving away from fossil fuels and all that, which all, you know, we were like, that's good, that's good, it's just a total good. We're still using those older economic models where the industry gets to decide how we're spending our public dollars that really are not going to lead to equity. Um, so, for example, in like the shared use mobility industry, um, there has been a lot of interest coming from companies like Lime and uh, Lyft and, and places like that around partnering with local organizations like PMJ to do basically equity marketing. You know, they, they know, they get like, oh yeah, we got to get, you know, got to get that local POC group on board and that's going to help to show that this stuff is needed in those neighborhoods too. And ultimately, um, that approach to equity is really not based on this deeper understanding of equity as an ownership stake. Because those companies are not B corporations, they're not worker-owned cooperatives, they're not locally owned. They, in some cases, are actively working at the state level to minimize uh, local regulation and oversight of their business practices. So, you know, when you talk about what subsidies are available, my question would be, well, how did the electric vehicle industry make sure that the government was going to be putting that money in their pocket? How did the e-bike industry make sure the government was going to be putting that money in their pocket? And I don't, I don't think that, like, the mobility justice approach has to be opposed to industry, but I just, I don't think we can claim to be looking for opportunities for equity or, or making changes if we just continue to use that inequitable model. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it, this is very emergent. I think that, like, like I was saying, it took me a long time to even understand, like, oh, in this eco-green transportation space I work in, there's an industry. It's like, they're a business. They're trying to make a profit. Oh, even though it's all about, like, you know, reducing our carbon footprint. Um, if, if you look back at the history of where um, government investment in transportation infrastructure has gone, it's always benefited industry. That's, that's how it's been. So if we actually want to change that, I don't think it's going to happen overnight, and I don't think it's, I don't exactly know what the steps are, but I think that's a good starting point is recognizing when equity is being used in favor of continuing industry practices versus bringing new kinds of needs from local communities into the investment process. Hi, um, can you speak to the legacy of the 1996 lawsuit against the LA bus or against LA Transit Authority by the Bus Riders Union? Kind of lessons learned today. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, there is a lot of good information out there for folks who want to learn more about the Bus Riders Union. So I won't say too much about it. Like, there's really good documentary and um, lots of academic writing that uh, really uh, recognizes how they created the model for transit justice. But in a nutshell. Uh, this group uh, was successful in suing uh, the Transit Authority in LA, Metro, under Title VI, um, claiming that Metro had racially discriminatory practices and how they were investing in transit infrastructure. So the Transit Authority had been pulling a bunch of money from buses, putting that money toward uh, the expansion of light rail, and um, in terms of who was being served by those forms of transit, uh, you know, a, a federal judge agreed that it showed discrimination. So um, they got what people refer to as the consent decree, and I am no legal language expert, so I don't even want to try and interpret what that all means, but the, the real effects of that lawsuit were that fares stayed at $1.25 per ride until 2009 or 10, which was, I, you know, way lower than um, any other big city's transit system. They had a, a day pass that I think was kept at $3 for a long time, and then it went up to 5 um, There had to be rider participation in decision-making at Metro. I think they also uh, take credit for pushing the transit authority toward a cleaner, fee cleaner fleet of uh, natural gas buses. So, um, so yeah, so in terms of affecting the experience of riders in LA, the Bus Riders Union are like probably the, the, the biggest rock stars in terms of, of meeting, uh, getting their demands met. But yeah, I totally encourage people to look into that more. I've never been affiliated with them. I was like a, a member for one year and then I don't think they actually exist as a campaign any longer, but the organization that launched it the Labor and Community Strategy Center is still a, um, a strong leader in LA organizing. I actually, uh, yeah, I want to make sure that she gets to ask. She's had her hand up for a long time. Yeah, concluding question. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so I had, a que I had the question earlier I thought was good about, you know, we're looking for models on, on what we can do better and what other cities are doing better. I, and I'd ask a little more kind of targeted version of that in, in your work. What campaigns or even graphics or statistics, just what are, have you seen something that really resonates with the general public as to raise awareness of this, of this issue? I mean, I think the, the people in this room are, are very articulate and very aware, but is there something that in, in, you know, really resonates with the public? And then are the, a second part of that a tool, a technique, uh, something that really works within the decision-making bodies to, to open this up in a, in a kind of an aha way. I, I, I'm just sort of interested in your experiences on those two levels. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, the cards that I was passing around are two examples of attempts that um, the Antokinane and now PMJ have been experimenting with around how to explain kind of what all can be contained within this mobility justice landscape. Um, and we're also um, working on, so those are the 1.0 principles of mobility justice. This year we're taking on doing 2.0 principles and trying to make it into a video project because videos are pr 
more accessible than text-based projects are. Um, but yeah, this is this is you know this is a still very emergent uh, conversation and space. So I don't I don't think besides these kind of experiments that um, we're working with and that we welcome feedback on, uh, there's not too many things out there um, in terms of how to provoke that aha moment. I I think that it's really useful and and this can be provocative because you don't know where people are coming from, but it's really useful to bring up Black Lives Matter because like <laughs> there's it's 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 pretty black and white uh, when it comes to what that movement is focused on and so when you say here's what I mean by street safety black lives matter either that person is gonna get it and be like oh huh I hadn't thought about that but oh yeah hmm huh this stuff is all it's there, like in the cultural subconscious. I get to talk to people about transportation all the time. And everybody knows about the bias toward the bus. Everybody knows that uh, our transportation choices reflect all this race and class stuff. Everybody knows that you're gonna be less safe traveling out there if you're a certain color or a certain gender and all that. Um, so it can, I think that when you bring up something like Black Lives Matter, it kind of pushes people to make those common sense connections that haven't necessarily been mapped out, but that they, they probably have a sense about. Um, you know, we, mm, I think a lot of us probably had experiences of feeling embarrassed for riding the bus at some point, or, you know, have seen media that references how if you're riding a bicycle and you're a grown man, you must be a 40 year old virgin or, you know, whatever kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, so, so mentioning something like that, pointing to a group that has their values just like laid out and very clear. Um, so uh, a good example, so the Black Lives Matter movement or the movement for black lives, which I think is the more appropriate way to describe it, um, isn't necessarily, a, a, um, I don't know what kind of like, you know, they have a good website. So you can refer people to that. There's also a project called Campaign Zero, which we are overdue for making some connections between Vision Zero and Campaign Zero. Campaign Zero is about getting to zero, um, uh, I think it's gun deaths? I can't remember exactly what their anti-violence scope is. Um, but just bringing up stuff like that where you can say, yeah, you know, there's actually this whole world of people who've been working on this issue for a long time, and we're just trying to make a connection with it. It's not about reinventing the wheel or like making our jobs harder. It's just a matter of, you know, when we move forward, we're gonna do it in tandem with this other group. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I have a question. What is your approach whenever it comes to uh, community engagement and the trust between the community and the city? because our neighborhood is pretty much getting into the, uh, there's a lot of gentrification. Mm -hmm. So whenever I talk to my uh, neighbors, it's all about the city trying to fix m our community to the gentrifiers. It's not fixing our community for us, but it's fixing it for the people that are coming ta to take our place. Mm -hmm. What is your approach? whenever you go and talk to the community, because I'm a community organizer. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a hard topic, and you don't want to be against everything that is going on in the community, but you also want to be able to, to empower the community to voice their opinions and voice their power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, there's, uh, well, one thing I want to mention is the Right to the City Coalition. Um, maybe you're already familiar with them or there may be a local organization in Austin that's part of that coalition, but they're a group of um, anti-displacement and economic justice groups around the country that um, work under this shared idea of a right to the city. People have a right to remain in the neighborhoods where they're living and then looking at ways to address that through increasing affordable housing or anti-displacement measures. And um, so I, I really respect their leadership in that arena. When it comes to on the ground, meeting people where they're at, that's where it becomes important to recognize that 
I'm not here promoting bicycling. Because if you're actually going to be willing to meet people where they're at and then define what the mobility solutions are, you actually need to let them define the problems. And it may be that you're talking about a neighborhood where from a planning standpoint or an advocacy standpoint, there needs to be a bike lane or you know some kind of uh, improvement like that. Maybe from the resident standpoint, that's not number one what needs to happen. And so actually being able to go in with that awareness, that's how you build trust. You know, if you're coming in and your goal is to get the community on board with what you already decided they need, people figure that out pretty quickly, you know, like, unless it's something that they're like, yeah, I'm going to benefit from that really clearly. Um, if it's something that they're already like skeptical about, and then you're trying to convince them that it's on their own behalf, I think that just exacerbates the problem. So, so yeah, truly being open to community members getting to define their problems and solutions is the approach that I try to use. And in addition to teaching at Antioch, being an advisory board co-chair with people from mobility justice, uh, being a core organizer with the Intokening, I also sometimes help out with a planning firm called Pueblo based in Los Angeles. And so we're actively like experimenting with that now, like actually getting to be part of community engagement projects. So I feel like I have a lot of um, learning to do in that arena, but that's like baseline what I've learned. You can't go in and build trust if you're not willing to actually be in support of um, helping people forward on the, their own terms. Staying a little longer on this really important topic, obviously, um, you know, proof proof that there's a lot of discussion um, that needs to continue around this topic as we as we move into implementing ambitious sustainable transportation plans for the city of Austin. So I want to thank you all for being here and thank you Dr. Lugo for being here and um, giving us your wisdom on this important topic. There's always trade-offs and uh, we look forward uh, as staff at the city of Austin Transportation Department working with our policymakers um, who are here today and the advocacy organizations and residents here today to continue working on this issue and I